Turn in your Bibles with me to Mark chapter 16. I'm hoping to be able to finish this evangelist's testimony of the uh, events of Jesus Christ's life this morning. We've been on this book of action. You know, Mark is this moving quickly, uh, and he doesn't give all the details because he's writing to a Gentile or a pagan people instead of uh, what the other authors are writing to. And I like to always remind you that um, there's four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You can call fifth Gospel if you take the book of Acts. Some people call it a Gospel too because it continues with the the uh, facts uh, pertaining to the kingdom of God. And uh, I like to always say, like, if you had a jury trial, think about this for a minute, because in order to understand any of the Gospels, you need the facts of the other three. The, the first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are called the synoptic. They're, this, they're, they're like written in the same time period, most of the same facts. Uh, but then John was written some 35 years later. When you take all four of the witnesses, because that's what it is, you and I as Christians become witnesses giving testimony in a world courtroom of everything that's going on. So you and I, in order to understand the crucifixion and the life of Jesus better, we need to take all four of those Gospels and put that evidence together. Now think about this. If you've ever sat on a jury trial, I have. It's, it's, it's really uh, surreal. I thought I always wanted to do it, and then I did it, and I was like, I don't want to do this. Because you have somebody's life in your hand. Listen, here on this jury that's impaneled, you're a member of the jury. Listen to me. But it's your life that's in peril. It's your life that's hanging in the balance. And you're taking all the evidence of the witnesses of the people of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit's there trying to convict you that this is real. And then you look at the four witnesses, the four testimonies of the people who are on the stand and they wrote this book. These Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and now you've got to take those facts and go, well, wait a minute. They said only one angel was there, and then the other guy says there was two angels there. And then, wait a minute. They said they came early in the morning. The other one says on the first day of the week. And, and you've got to take those facts and know that people tell the same exact testimony of an event, but they tell it just a little bit differently. And you, when you weave them together... As the fabric of those testimonies go together, it gives you a perfect historicity, if you will, or testimony of what happened with Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, God with us. And now you have to be a, a person on the jury who votes. Was he a lunatic? Was he lying? Did it happen? Am I going to believe and put my entire soul trusted into the blood of Jesus? Did he die for the sins of the world? Or should I yell, Barabbas, Barabbas, crucify Jesus, as the rest of the people did. And so let me give you some more information. See, when you're being a juror, you want to look at Barabbas. See, we know for a fact everybody knew that he was an insurrectionist. He was, a rebe he was in the rebellion. He committed murder, that he was deserving of death. But there was no testimony at all. Nobody could give any testimony against Jesus. Pilate said, I washed my hands of this seven times. He's an innocent man. What do you want me to do? Release Jesus? And they said, no, Barabbas. And it's important to note that Barabbas means son of the father. Bar is always son. Abbas is always father. So you have the true son of the father, innocent lamb of God, who did not say a word because he knew if he would have spoke, they would have found him innocent. That, the, that, that Pilate would have said, let him go. That the people would have said, we find no fault in him. So he kept his mouth shut. He didn't present any evidence that he was not guilty. He just remained silent, as a lamb does before this year. But Barabbas, we know for a fact, was a murderer. Nobody denies it. And Barabbas represents you and me. And the people chose the son of the father of lies, the devil's son. They chose to continue. Are you on the jury, impaneled, listen to the evidence of the four Gospels, and how do you decide? Do you want to remain Barabbas? Do you want to stay in your flesh? Do you want to receive the punishment of what the sin nature brings, cast into hell, separated from God forever? Or do you want to choose the free gift from God? 
the blood of Jesus. It's freely given. Freely given. All you have to do is receive it and say yes. And then he'll do the rest. So when we closed in chapter 15 last week, we know that Jesus was crucified. He's hanging on a tree. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, the law would tell us. And as he hung there, when you bring the other gospels in, he said, Father, receive my spirit. And they didn't kill him. He gave his spirit freely. He gave his life freely. In fact, when they go back and they tell him that Jesus is already dead, Pilate marvels again because it usually takes sometimes six days for a person crucified to die. That they just hang on. He was thinking, that guy was a strong dude. He's like 33 years old. He was a carpenter. It's going to take a while for him to die hanging on the cross. And he marveled that he was dead so quickly. And it's because he gave his spirit. Nobody took it. And the scriptures say that not a bone was broken. So what they would do in order to hasten the death, because you're pushing up so that your lung cavity can open and you can breathe, you're pushing up. What they would do to, in order to speed up the person's death is they'd break their legs. So as he gives up his spirit freely, he gave up his life freely for you and me, the veil, it says in 15, can't see, 15... 38, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. Why is that important? Well, if you're reading through the Bible with us, I said it earlier. Is this mic still on? Mm -hmm. Sound like it wasn't on. As I said earlier, if you're reading through the Bible, you just read Leviticus 16, which has all of that. It's the Day of Atonement. And that's what day this is. Jesus is dying on the Day of Atonement. Under law, there's priests that are killing lambs. Right now, as we speak, their blood is running out on the altar. And if you go read Leviticus 16, that's what was going on. But you know what they did? They used two goats. They used two animals. One they would kill and the blood would pour out. The other one they would confess all the sins on its head. And then they would take a, a man that was faithful and trustworthy and they would lead it as far as they could away from camp and let it go free. And see, you can be the one who goes free, just like Barabbas. You, you listening to me? We are Barabbas, but we can go free if we choose the blood of the one that died. <clears throat> but the one that goes free also represents resurrection. Because that's what comes next after the death is resurrection, new life. Jesus gets up. That's what we're getting ready to enter into in chapter 16. Jesus doesn't stay in the grave. And when the veil is rent, what's it rent for? Because Jesus now makes a way for you and I to come boldly to the throne of grace and obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Every Old Testament lamb that was killed, the blood that was spilled, represented this same sacrifice. But it was the blood that you and I don't have to give. The animals did it for us. And now you can walk in now. Before you couldn't. Only the high priest could go in behind the veil. Only one time a year. Only on Yom Kippur. Only after he made a sacrifice for himself. But Jesus becomes the priest and the sacrifice. And now the veil, or the veil is ripped from the top down. Not only can we come in. But there's no need anymore to hide anything back there. Because the people that come in are the people that have been forgiven that have believed in Jesus, and God comes out, and he's with us, and now we can freely be among him, and there's no need for any more sacrifices. Why? Because Jesus paid for all the sins of the world. The veil's not needed anymore. It's clearly open to all mankind, even to those who reject it. Clearly open. You can see that now you can come in. It's all paid for. God's already received his son's blood. He went in and pours his blood out on the altar for you and I. You don't have to understand it to believe it. What you have to understand is that you're a sinner that's in need of a Savior. And the provision is Jesus Christ's blood and there's none other coming. And there's no other way to escape. He made an atoning sacrifice. Atonement, if you break it into three parts, means at one with God. 
See, sin separates us from God, and God has put a plan in place that would bring us back to at one man, communion, co-union, in unity with God. And the only way to do that is the blood of Jesus. We had a guy that used to come here, and he goes, well, Greg, I understand Jesus, and I believe, but what in the world does barn animals have to do with salvation? They were always a type. Just a type. Until Jesus came and laid down his life freely, his sinless life, for the sins of the world. Nobody took his life. He gave it freely. Have you received that gift? Have you opened that gift? Are you enjoying that gift? Have you been set free from your sins? The veil has been rent. You can come in. Most Christians never enter in to the Holy of Holies. They stay outside in the Gentile court. They remain a pagan. They continue to practice what they've always done. When you can come in and sit with God and sup with God and fellowship with God Almighty because of the blood of Jesus and be conformed into His image. Just like He did in the garden. He created man in His image. Sin flipped us upside downward and Christ's blood flips us right side up again. This is the message that, that turned Rome upside downward, that drove Nero crazy, and he burnt down Rome. Why he played a violin? Because he rejected the gospel. You want to heal mental health in, a, in the world? Stop rejecting the gospel. Stop rejecting the gospel. When you reject the only thing that saves souls and heals lives and makes man whole, the propitiation, the payment for sin, the blood of Jesus. Don't be surprised at what effects it has on the rest of your life. But when you receive him, hold on because he wants to use you for his glory. He wants you to be a witness. And that's exactly what happens with these next people. They were, they were there. They seen him crucified. All the guys went and hid, by the way. Listen to me. Right now, the only men that, that just showed up was Joseph of Arimathea, and if you pull in John's Gospel, Nicodemus. They were pretty powerful men in the Sanhedrin, but they believed that Jesus was Lord, that Jesus was the Messiah, and they come and ask Pilate for the body, and they laid him in a, in a, in a brand new tomb. And they buried him. And as we closed in 15, the last verse said, and Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of Joseph observed where he was laid. They observed where the tomb was. I don't know if you know, I don't think this text does it. Does this text tell it? See, I started reading all four of them to get the testimony, to put it together in my mind. It doesn't tell. I think it's John that says, Mary Magdalene, whose seven demons were cast out by Jesus. Seven demons. Oh, there's no demons. Come on. Are you one of those Bible thumpers that believes in demons? Oh, yeah. Quite, quite certainly. Demons are real. A third of them fell. They're fallen angels that become demons. They're evil. The Bible calls them devils because they're just like their father, the father of all lives, who is the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning. That's where death culture comes from, is his government. His government has been wanting to come to the forefront since the garden. Eve believed their government, and Eve let the word of God die, and she followed their government. Their government is here again, but it's only because God allows it. Make no mistake, the devil has no power that God doesn't allow him to have. That's why the Bible teaches that greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. If you have Jesus in your heart and you believe in his blood, the devil can't do nothing to you unless you let him by believing the lie. Because God is already on the cross with the blood of Jesus taking the power of sin, the penalty of sin. And he wants to take you from the presence of sin. One day we'll go to heaven out of the presence of sin. Out of the presence of people who would reject the ruling authority of God, his word, and his kingdom. The crazy thing is, and we was rehearsing it the other day talking about it, that after there's a thousand year millennial reign after that where Christ literally sits on the throne in Jerusalem, and all the people that are saints will rule with him in some capacity, and then there's all these other people that are born during the thousand-year millennial reign, and then the devil gets released from the abyss just for a moment, from prison, 
and people still follow him. After they've been in the presence of Almighty God for a thousand years, there's people that still follow him. Now, not Christians, because once we're with him, we'll always be with him. That's forever sealed. We become just like him when, when the rapture happens or when we go to be with Christ in heaven. But the devil is a very clever tactician who tells a really good lie that looks just like the church, except it's called religion. It has a form of godliness, but it denies the power of the Spirit of God which is how God is operating in our lives today. The Spirit of God comes and He convicts you of sin and righteousness and judgment. You're a sinner. This Jesus is righteous and there's going to be judgment for your sin. And the only way you can go to heaven is to receive the righteousness that comes from God through Jesus Christ on the cross. So the Holy Spirit begins to do that. The Holy Spirit begins to, to convict you. And when you say yes to Jesus, then the Holy Spirit comes and lives in your heart and does what the Ephesians 1.13 says, seals you until the day of redemption. It's like putting earnest money down on a car or putting earnest money down on a house. You go, here, I'm going to come back. I'm going to get a loan from the bank and I'm going to buy this. Here's the money to prove that I'm coming back. So you get the first part of the Holy Spirit. It seals you. You become sealed with like a signet ring from a king, King Jesus. And he promises that he's coming back to get us one day. To redeem that which he has purchased. And then the Holy Spirit does what, Greg? Well, then he can give you power. He can teach you what the scriptures are saying. He opens your spiritual eyes. And the Bible says in Romans 8, 14, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the children of God. So you want to have evidence? You want to have proof? You want to know you're a child of God? Then be led by the Spirit of God. Well, what's he want to lead us in, Greg? He wants to show us the Word of God, the testimony of God, the work of God that he's done, that he's doing, that he's going to do. And he wants us to tell other people the testimony of that so that they can be set free and one day spend eternity with him just like you and I have been promised. What does the devil want to do with his kingdom? He wants to bring this death culture that kills every opportunity you have. He wants you to believe that you're a sinner and you sinned yesterday so you can't tell nobody today. But God wants you to know that he set you free from sin and the penalty of sin and the power of sin and that even if you sinned yesterday... You can still tell somebody the truth today. Now, should you confess that sin? Yeah, he says if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive your sin. And then what's he going to do? He doesn't just forgive you. He wants to make you like him. He begins to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Sin is unrighteousness. Sin is lawlessness. Lawlessness is sin. So there's a process going on. But in the meantime, see, we know we still sin. But the penalty has been taken so you can run the race freely. The power has been taken so you can run in the power of the Spirit freely. And one day he's going to take us from the very presence. It's called glorification. He'll glorify us by taking us to heaven and making us just like him. When we see him, we'll be like him face to face. When he appears, we will appear because we are hidden in Christ. If you're led by the Spirit and you're surrendering, you're hidden in Christ. The Father only sees Christ and His righteousness. But you know what? The devil knows who you are. And he wants to attack you. What's he going to do? He brings the death culture. He tells you a lie. And you go, okay, I'm going to follow the lie. Then you go sideways. Because you're following the lie. That's why you need to learn the truth. Spend time in the Word of God. God says He testifies Himself. My people perish from lack of knowledge. Knowledge of what he's done. Knowledge of what he's doing. Knowledge of what he's going to do. Knowledge of who he is. And that he loves us. He's not against you. He's not mad at you. He loves you with an never ending love. So much so that he gave his greatest possession. His only son. Who does that? Who does that? All you have to do is believe. All you have to do is believe that in your heart and confess it with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, 9, and 10. Sorry, I had to turn the heat down. It's getting hot up here. I love it's hot out there. But it's getting hot in here. 
and it makes too much noise. So now let's look. Because after death, the wages of sin is death. What comes after death? Resurrection. Okay, one more time. Let's go. John 5. I want to go to John 5. I've been here three times this week. John 5. Very important scripture for you because I want you to know that you're born dead. Sounds like an oxymoron because you just were born and blood's flowing through you. But it's a physical birth. You're born spiritually dead because of the original sin. John 5, 24 tells you this. Listen. Most assuredly, Jesus speaking, I say to you, he who hears my word, hears, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, and believes, that means to entrust your spiritual well-being into Christ, in him who has sent me has everlasting life, and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. Passed from death into life. See, you were dead spiritually, and when you hear the Word of God and you believe the Word of God and the message that was sent by the Father through the gift of His Son, you come to life. It's the only way to have spiritual eyes. It's the only way to be sealed by the Holy Spirit is to hear the Word and then believe it in your heart and confess it with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that God raised Him from the dead. And then he says in 25, Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming, and it now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. Have you heard his voice? Then you should be living. You're alive now. The Spirit has woke you up to a life of Christ. Then he goes on to talk about the resurrection of the dead and the resurrection of the life, which is a different resurrection. When you believe, when you hear the voice of God, when you believe the word of God, you are resurrected from the dead. When you hear and believe, you are resurrected from spiritually dead. And now you have life and you become a child of God. And now you can be led by the spirit of God for the glory of God to tell others the testimony of what God has done and what he's doing with his son, Jesus Christ. Now we're going to see Jesus raised from the dead. Let's look at chapter 16. I'm going to read it and we'll make some comments. Verse 1. Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen, and they said among themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in long white robes sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Frightened is the King James. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he cast seven demons. It is in this text. She went and told those who had been with him, and they mourned and wept, as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. After that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later, he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table. And he rebuked their unbelief and their hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe in the name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. 
So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and set down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. Again, very fast. Mark's gospel is a gospel of action. Is your Christian life a, a, a gospel of action? Are you doing anything to get the word of God out? To tell others the testimony, the witness that you have seen the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ? So it's a, it's a gospel of action. What are your actions since you believed in Jesus? Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would open our eyes. That if there's any veil that the devil has over our eyes, that you would remove it so that we could clearly see what you've called us to do in the ministry of reconciliation for your glory. Wake us up, Lord, at the heart of our Christian walk. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as I said, there's four uh, or three other testimonies that the evangelists give. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four together, need to be considered. If you want to do a study on that, sit down and read the text. Most Bibles have above that text the other three books, what they say about the same content, and you can go through and read together what is going on. Now, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. Isn't that interesting? Because they're going to find that the real sun had risen. We were just talking about Barabbas, son of the father, and then the real son of the father. And now you're talking about the physical sun in the sky is risen, but the real sun has risen also. So anyway, here they come. They had to wait for the Sabbath to be over because it was law. They weren't allowed to do anything on the Sabbath, right? So they waited. And in the Jewish culture, if you go back in Genesis, first book that you read, the book of Origins, every time you see that God created, you'll see, and the evening and the morning were the first day. And the evening and the morning were the second day. So their day starts at 6 o'clock at night. So it, it, when they talk about their day, you've got to understand that it's not the same as our clock. Their day starts at 6 at night and it ends at 6 in the morning. And so uh, when, the, when the Sabbath was over and it was okay to move about and to carry a burden, they went and bought spices. They didn't do embalming like we do. They didn't do embalming like the Egyptians did when they would bury somebody. They would wrap them in a blanket. They put perfume on their bodies, myrrh and oils that smelled so that the stink wouldn't be smelled outside the tomb, outside the grave. So that's what they would do. And these ladies have decided that they're going to buy some spices, so they buy them. And then on the first day of the week, which would be Sunday, and if you take all of them together, you find out that quite possibly either Mary Magdalene came by herself while it was still dark, John says, or she came with some other people with her, but she was leading the group. So this is how she might have seen that there was a stone over the grave, or it could have been because as we finish in 15, it said, and they seen where he was laid. But see, later they came and roll a stone. Later they come and seal it. Actually, let's look at it. Matthew 27. A couple of things I just want you to see. Matthew 27, uh, 62. Is that correct? Yes. A couple of things we want to make sure you understand that happened that Mark doesn't tell, and it's because of his audience. You always consider your audience when you're speaking, when you're saying something. Your audience can change uh, uh, and what they understand. And so with a pagan audience, a Roman audience, he doesn't tell a lot of things that Jewish people would have known. On the next day, Matthew 27, 62, it's the day after the day of preparation, which would have been um, the day before the Sabbath, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together to Pilate. So they come back and they said, Sir, we remember while he was still alive... How the deceiver said, after three days I will rise. Now listen to me. The pagans, the unbelievers remembered him saying it, but his own disciples didn't get it. They, he told them at least six or seven times on the way to Jerusalem that I'm going to be betrayed into the hands of evil men and they're going to crucify me and kill me. But on the third day I'll rise, so meet me in Galilee. 
And they were like, oh, they're in all the confusion. When the, when the, when the shaking comes, when the, when the shepherd is struck and they scatter, they forget what they were supposed to do. That's why you're supposed to be ready. You're supposed to be looking and waiting and watching and trusting God so that when the battle comes, you already know what you're called to do. But we're in good company because Peter backslides and the whole crew of them go out fishing. And we read that in John 21 a couple weeks ago. So he says, they already know. He said, I'm going to rise in the third day, 64. Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first deception. Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go your way, make it secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. See, this is something that Mary Magdalene and them probably didn't see because it happened the following day after they were looking at the tomb. Now flip over to Matthew 28, 11. Now while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priest all the things that had happened. When they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, Tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while he slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. So what I wanted you to see before I read to you that he's not there, he has risen, is that there was already a plan in place, death culture, to kill the resurrection. That plan, we're going to have Resurrection Sunday here in about three weeks, four weeks. Anybody know it's uh, first Sunday, I think, of uh, March? April. I'm sorry, April. March would be like next week, or two weeks that way. So we're going to have that, and we'll talk further on the resurrection. But see, I don't call it Easter Sunday, Sunday on purpose because that's part to me of death culture that wants to kill the resurrection. See, because if Jesus didn't get up out of the grave, we have no proof that he was the Messiah. The fact that God raised him from the dead and, 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 and that he got up in resurrection proves that you and I can raise again. Proves that God accepted his blood as a sacrifice, as a payment for the sins of the world. Because if you go to any other God, any other so-called God, any other false God, Muhammad, Joseph Smith, you go to Confucius, you go to anybody's grave, and their bones are still in there. When you go to Jesus' tomb, it's empty. Because he was God, very God. He was sinless. The wages of sin is death. He got back up. He took our sin for us, and God received that payment because he's a just God. Somebody had to pay for the sin, or he wouldn't be a just God. And he loved the world so much that he came and did it for us. So that we, if we just believe that God is that good of a God, we can have fellowship with him forever. And be with him forever. Just believe it in your heart and confess it with your mouth. So they came and they brought some spices. They want to anoint the body. It's very early in the morning on the first day of the week. Many believe that's why church is held on Sunday. You can have church on any day of the week. But we, so, we do it in America. We do it in, in, in the Christian church on Sundays because it's the first day of the week. It's the day that he rose from the grave. It's just a tradition. You can do it every single day of the week if you want. We have Bible studies on other days. Church is only the ecclesia, the called out ones, coming together to learn truth like a, like a huddle on a football team. You learn, what's the next play? What do we do next? How do we live freely and witness to Jesus Christ? And then you go back out to your respective sphere of influences and tell them the testimony of Jesus Christ. But you know what's most important? Not telling them, but living it out in front of them. See, I know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But when you see what Jesus does, Acts chapter 1, all that Jesus began to do and then to teach. He did it first and it opened people's eyes so that he could teach them what he was doing. When he's on the road to Emmaus, we might go there in a minute. He began to teach first or to the deeds first 
that were done, and then he could teach. So it's very important to obey and observe and walk out what is going on. Then you become the witness and the evidence of the true testimony of Jesus Christ. Listen to me. That does not mean that you have to do this perfectly. Part of walking it out sometimes is going back and apologizing. Who does that? I, don't, I can't even I can't even tell you how many times I've apologized to people for something. They go, who cares? Because they're not used to it. They're not used for somebody to come back and humble themselves and say, you know what? I'm a Christian and I really shouldn't have said that to you and I'm sorry. What's that mean to me? Get away from me, dude. You're weird. But you still need to do that because that's part of doing. That's part of the deeds. That's part of what God would call you to do. If you know you were wrong and God convicts you of being wrong, then go apologize. You know what? Where This is a really good tool. It's a great tool in marriage. It's the most amazing tool in marriage you'll ever see. Love covers a multitude of sin, but confessing your sin and apologizing to your mate no matter what they do, is a great tool for reconciliation. Look what God did for us. He died in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't even wait for you to repent. He freely gave long before you apologized, long before you said, forgive me, long before you repented and turned and rose from the dead and became alive. How did he get there? I don't even know how I got there. Come look down at the page and go, where did that come from? First day of the week. <clears throat> this, and she comes, they come to the tomb before the sun has risen. Hmm. I love that. All the typology. Verse 3. And they said among themselves. So they are walking there, and they said among themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? So they know there's this huge stone there, right? And there's just several women. If you put all the contexts together, there might be a group of 12 women. We don't know. There's a bunch of them. There's a lot of Marys, too. You know, in that day, there was a lot of Marys and a lot of Jesuses. I ain't making nothing of it. I'm just telling you. There was at least three Marys, if you look at John's text. At least three Marys, because Jesus' mother was there. And then both of these ladies are named Mary. You know what Mary means? Their rebellion. That's what it means. Their rebellion. That's what this is all about. Their rebellion. Who? Barabbas and his rest of the people that are born. We all have rebellion. It's all about our rebellion. Because of our rebellion to the word of God, the authority of God, the kingship of God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, he has to come and die to redeem us. And he wants to have fellowship for eternity for anybody who would just choose to believe. See, because he could choose and just speak and create robots, but he wants people that at least have a heart that says, I want to choose you. I want to be free. I want to be with you, but I have no capacity for it. My sin and my flesh hate you. I, I'm an enemy of you just by nature. And he says, well, I'll give you a new nature if you'll just say yes. I'll change how you think if you'll just draw near. Isn't that beautiful? It's not a robot. Can you imagine being in heaven for eternity and after about the, you know, 10,000th year, there's a guy standing there going, I don't want to do this anymore. Why is he making me stay here? No, it's not going to happen because everybody's going to long to be with him. And because you long to be with him, even when you don't, you confess it and say, Lord, I don't want to do this. Can you help me have a desire to do this? Then he changes your desires. He makes you want to be in fellowship because he's love and he loves fellowship. So he makes you like him. And so 10,000 years after you've been there, you're still going to be loving it because you're going to be just like him. But it's all because of the blood of Jesus. It's not because of anything you can do. In fact, the only thing you can do is get in the way. The only thing you can do is reject it. The only thing you can do is try to do it on your own without the spirit of God. The only thing you can do is try to do like Adam and Eve did, and you put fig leaves over your bad parts. Let me cover my sin. Let me cover up what I think is my sin instead of asking God what is really my sin and letting him cover it with the blood of Jesus. 
fig leaves just become some kind of works. It's got nothing to do with salvation. So here they are. They're at the tomb. They know that there's a stone there. And they're like, who's going to roll it away? Now listen, that won't work today. Not in death culture. I know. I rush in where angel spirit to tread, and there I am. See, in death culture, the women would have said, we can move it. We don't need any men to move that rock. Not being mean to you women, I really am not. Because, see, you guys have been sold a false bill of, of goods, and you've been lied to. And you've been told that you're equal. In strength and stamina, physically, and you're not. You're created gentle, and you were created less than a man's muscles on purpose. So that you could be taken care of. So you could be nurtured and loved on. The same way we were created as a creation, less than God, so that he could come and save us and take care of us and nurse us and cherish us and love us and give his life for us. The woman was created that way purposely so that men would lay down their lives for their bride, for the one with the less muscles. I don't know if you guys read the story where a death culture created this man who said he was a woman and he got in the ring and they got in a boxing match with a woman, a real woman, and she ended up in the hospital, almost died. That's what death culture does. You can never put a man's muscles against a woman's muscles and think that that woman is going to win. So does it happen? Yeah, a blind squirrel will find a nut every once in a while. You put the weakest man on the planet against the strongest woman on the planet, he might lose. But it's not the law. It's not creation. It's not what's supposed to be. Each of us are designed for a specific purpose. Each of us. And death culture might tell you that you can change your gender. That's what trans means. Trans means no gender. means no gender. God said, I made a male and female. But when you say no to God, you've entered into death culture. I'm not against any transgender. I'm not against any homosexual. I, I, I am against the death culture that would lie to them and tell them that they don't have to be what God created them. Because he made them fearfully and wonderfully. And I want to help them in love and tell them that that's not a possibility. You were created this way by God. He loves you. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. And you need to receive the gospel. If you don't, you're believing the lying culture, the death culture. And it's going to get worse for you. It's not going to get better. Because that soul is going to be judged by God the way he created it. Not the way it wanted to be. It's no different than any other sin. It's a lie from the devil but it creates a dysphoria. It used to be called a mental illness, but you know what it is? It's sin. It's always been sin. But now we're in, you know, the, even the church is in the marketplace arguing whether it's a mental illness or whether it's real. No, it's sin. Because sin causes most mental illnesses. I'm not going to say all. I'm not God. I can't emphatically tell you that. But I believe that. And the wages of sin is death. Listen to me. I hate to bring that up, but we have to have truth on the table in order to understand what's going on in our culture. And I know that sometimes that really hurts us. But you know what? When I go to work in the morning, I'm a worker. I'm not the boss. And I think I'm the boss, but I have to humble myself and bow down to the real boss. That's just part of life. Everything, since the beginning, in the garden, there's always been an authority that everybody has to bow down to. And they're answerable to God. And when you disobey that authority, you're in sin. And that's what happened in the garden. They disobeyed the authority of God. What happens when I say, hey, go do this. Adam, name the animals. Take care of your wife. That's my word going out. That's my instruction as the authority of that garden, the creator of it. And the devil come in and said, hey, God's holding out on you. And Eve believed it. Because the husband wasn't protecting her. She was deceived, the Bible teaches. But Adam wasn't deceived. Adam wasn't deceived at all. And he gets the credit for it in the New Testament. It's his sin. 
Adam wasn't deceived. He decided he wanted to follow the woman and be with her, so he ate also. He followed her lead. Death culture begins. The death of a relationship with God, the death of the Spirit. Sure enough, you will surely die, God said, in the day that you eat. Death culture. It's not cancel culture. It's canceling the Word of God. It's death culture. Because you can go nowhere but death apart from God. You can't bear any fruit except death apart from God. That's the only lesson you need to learn in this entire vast time you're on this planet. Is that the only way to leave this place alive is to know Jesus Christ and his blood. That's the only lesson we're here to learn. If you're bad at telling somebody else about it, okay, you're bad at it. But you have to learn the lesson and receive the spirit and trust in the blood or you go to hell. You're born once, you're going to die twice. You're going to die a physical death and then a spiritual death cast into hell. If you're born twice, once physically in water, and then the second time by the blood of Jesus, you only die once. Physical death. And then you're alive for eternity, present with the Lord forever. It's that simple. And that's what truth does. It sets you free. If you believe that, it sets you free from the lie that they're telling you. Now you don't have to be afraid of corona. Now you don't have to be afraid of death because if you're absent from the body, you're present with the Lord, you know that that's better than this ugly planet that's full of death culture. Now you don't have to be afraid of death at all. It has no sting. It has no victory. It sets us free. Who thought he could get through 20 verses and some other? Oh. Good thing the Lord showed up. Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? You know who will roll away the stone? God will. It's a gravestone. The only way to have life is let him to roll away the stone. Because you are sealed in death. And when you believe in the blood, you get sealed in the Holy Spirit. And that gravestone is rolled away from your heart. And the light of Jesus Christ shines in there and sets you free to follow him. And you don't have to be afraid anymore. You don't have to be alarmed. You don't have to freak out. Especially if they can't kill the body and take the soul. Only God can do that. I'm not telling you that in your emotions, if you're walking down a dark alley and you hear a noise behind you, it shouldn't frighten you. I'm not afraid. I'm serving Jesus. Come out of there with that gun. That's pretty stupid, isn't it? You might want to be a little bit frightened and make some actions under our feet. Don't fail me now. Get away from whoever that is and live to tell somebody else about Jesus. That's normal. But unfounded fear over something that's a lie is from the devil. It's death culture. And that's what we have going on on our planet with the government that is ruling. And I'm not talking about America. I'm talking about the whole world. The whole world. This is not about America. This is about the souls of the whole world. Death, burial, and resurrection is not about just the United States. Come on, where's our pride at? Death, burial, and resurrection was about the sins of the world. It's about the souls of everybody ever born in every country, everywhere. But we are so pathetic in America, we think it's only about us. Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb? Look, verse 4 answers it. But when they looked up. Have you been looking up? When you look up to God, when you look up to Jesus, they looked up and it was already gone. I'm looking up. I'm looking for my answers from God. I'm looking for my oxygen from heaven. I'm not going to look at death culture. The same devil that, that brings you death culture 101 is going to bring you the gasoline can to pour on your fire. And say, here's the answer. Take a bottle of these. Here's the answer. you got to do this. Here's the answer. Wear a mask. And he pours gasoline on your fear. And he pours gasoline on your fire. And pretty soon you're a bonfire. When all you have to do is listen to truth. And God is a consumer of fire. He consumes all fire. He's a consuming fire. 
if you allow him to burn away the lie and add to you the truth, you'll be set free. They looked up and they saw that the stone had been rolled away. And they were concerned, listen, because they knew it was a very large stone. Can you pay for your sin debt? No. Very large debt. See, the only way to pay for your sin debt, because there's two ways to be saved. There's two ways to be saved. You can believe in the blood of Jesus, or you can keep all the law from birth. Ooh. Can't keep all the law because we're sinners by nature. We're not sinners because we're sin, because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. A lot of difference. If I don't do anything wrong, I'm not a sinner. No, nope, you're a sinner already. Because of your inheritance from Adam. And the only way to get rid of being a sinner is to receive an inheritance from the second Adam, as Paul calls him, from Jesus. An inheritance of a new heart, a new life, a new home, a new father in heaven, instead of being Barabbas and following the father of lies. Be set free today with some truth. Look up. Look up. Look up. That large stone, that large debt, it's been paid. It's rolled away. You don't have to follow death culture. Five, in entering the tomb, so they went in to investigate. If you've been investigating, they entered the tomb. They saw a young man clothed. And now the other, a couple of the other texts tells us it's an angel. One of them, John says there's two of them there. This one possibly spoke, and that's the only one that Mark is really talking about as he investigated. He's got a long robe sitting on the right side and they said or excuse me and they were alarmed why because anytime you've seen an angel in that culture they were falsely taught that you were going to die now think about it on the on this on the, on the scheme of things now we know the wages of sin is dead but on the scheme of things all the men are hiding why because when they would take a leader and kill him they would also take all the male followers and kill them so that they didn't allow that movement to keep going. The women were freely there because they never killed the women. And so now the women who know this truth see an angel, so they have been taught that they're going to die, so they have a little bit of fear in them, now thinking that they might die. So what does the angel do? Are they not all ministering spirits that are sent to assist those who might inherit eternal life? Yeah, Hebrews 1... Somewhere on the bottom of 1, Hebrews chapter 1. I forget the reference. They're all ministering angels. They're there to help us who would receive eternal life. Now look what they did. The angel helped them. He said, he said to them, don't be afraid. Isn't that what Jesus might say? You seek Jesus of Nazareth. The angel tells them who they're seeking, who was in this tomb, who is no longer there. He's helping them, assisting them who was crucified. We know he was crucified. He is risen. He's not here. Oh yeah, let me help you in your investigation and show you where he was laid. See, the angels helping them, leading them to truth, helping them to understand that what he had already told them happened, that he rose. That's what angels do. We don't worship angels, but they sometimes assist us. They sometimes protect us. They can help us. And that's what these angels do to these ladies who were afraid, help them to see that what they came to see was really his grave. It was really the place that he laid, but he's no longer here. Let me give you some more truth. He's risen. He stood back up. Well, what do we do? They're standing there alarmed. But go, verse 7, go tell his disciples. And then because they know, the angels already know that Peter has denied him three times, they said, and Peter. Here, let's give a special shout out to the one that's struggling the most right now because he denied him three times. Make sure Peter knows this. So they're ministering to Peter. That he's going before them into Galilee. There you will see him. And notice what they remind him of. As he said to you. See, Jesus told them this. They had already been warned of this. That's why I keep telling you about death culture. That's why I keep telling you about... I do not believe revival is coming because Jesus has already told us that perilous times are going to come. Jesus already told us that when strong delusion comes, when you see the fig tree blossom, know that that generation will not pass away until all things are fulfilled. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. 
Are you hearing his word? Are you listening? Are you believing it? Are you being a witness and telling others? That's what the angels just told these ladies to do. Go be a witness to what you've seen, what you know, what Jesus already told you. And they instantly become witnesses. Verse 8, so they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. What keeps you from saying anything to anyone? Fear. Death culture, fear. I'm not going to tell them, fear. See, if you've been set free from death culture, set free by the truth, you don't have any fear. The righteous are bold as lions because we serve the king. We're believer priests. It's fear that keeps you from speaking up what you know. Think about it. If you had a vial in your pocket that would heal cancer, would you leave it there? No, there's no fear there. I can make a lot of money and I can make a lot of friends. It's what everybody's looking for, the answer to cancer. I would give it to everybody. I would tell everybody, look what I invented. I did it in my basement. But we know Jesus. We know the blood of Christ. We know what sets all men free. We know the truth about death culture. We know the truth about what fear does. It paralyzes. Believe me, it paralyzes. But you talk about what you believe, even when it's a lie. You get on the internet, you read some story, it's a stupid story, it doesn't even make sense. You believe it, you go tell everybody about it. What about the gospel? This is the word of God. This is God's spoken word, his plan, what he's doing, what he's done, what he's going to do. We won't even read it, we won't even learn it. If they put it on the internet, will you read it? Never mind death culture, take it down. They don't want no truth on the internet. It's getting ready to happen. It's getting ready to happen a lot. They're putting them in prison in other countries for preaching the Bible. Because God said it would happen. We're coming to the end of all things. That's what our men's meeting was about yesterday. Let me give you that real quick. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. Just quickly, I'm just going to give you one line. This is where we started our men's meeting. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. But above all things, have fervent love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Who covered your sins? Love did. Love incarnate. That's how you have unity in the body of Christ. You don't let people practice it, but you cover their sin with mercy and grace and with love and you spur them on and you help them but you can't do that if you are in your house and you're not allowed to meet in a church you can't do that if death culture kills the church and separates you where you can't hear nothing except for their lie if they take away your ability to meet this is not new they did it in AD 70 if you guys ever know what the ictus is the ictus is a fish where they would draw a line in the sand and if the other person was a Christian they would look down and go and they'd draw the other line and they'd make a fish and then they could talk about Jesus without fear that they were going to die that's what the ictus comes from because of death culture they were not allowed to be Christians openly or they would die they were being killed it's not a new thing it's an old thing. There's nothing new under the sun. The devil's been trying to kill the witnesses and the testimony, and that's how he comes. He creates false institutions and false synagogues of Satan, and he creates a false gospel, and he gives you a false sense of security. I said a prayer. I always tell the story of the young man. It's sad. It's actually sad. It makes you want to weep. He comes forward at a service one morning. And after he said a prayer with the pastor, he literally jumped up in the air and clicked his heels and said, Cuckoo, can't get me now, Satan. That's what false gospel will do. That's what apostasy will teach people. That all you have to do is say the right words, Abracadabra, open sesame, and you're okay. The door will open. It's not in the Bible. What's in the Bible is someone who believes in their heart and confesses with their mouth. If you believe in your heart, you receive the Spirit, and then you go confess with your mouth, and your actions and your life change. Because now you're not part of death culture, you're part of life. And you've been set free. But when you're taught and taught and taught and indoctrinated with a lie, you'll think you're okay when you're really deceived. 
If we're set free, we'll obey. And part of obeying is confessing when we're not. As he washes and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And positionally, we're already perfect. Practically, he's making us complete and perfect, just like him. And that'll go on to the day that you see him face to face. So they went out because they were afraid, and they did nothing. Verse 9. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. Oh my goodness. So you might think that you're bad. You might think you've done some wrong stuff. You might think that, oh boy, I can't be saved. Listen, Mary Magdalene had seven demons. She's the first one at the tomb. Where much is forgiven, much will be required. She's like, I'm ready to go anoint him. He saved me. He set me free. I know I was crazy. I know I had demons. That's, a, that's an amazing testimony. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. So others are mourning and weeping over what he's already told them is not the end of it all. He's going to get back up. And she went and told them. And when they heard that, he was alive and had been seen by her they did not believe guess what that word is epistio see pistio is to believe and you put an a on the front of it a means no <clears throat> no belief no faith no trust we went through this what last week atheist no theist no theos no god Agnostic, no knowledge. You put an A on the front of G N O S. It means no. And that's what trans means. Transgressor, no law. Transgender, no gender. But it all culminates in death culture that says no to God. What's evolution mean? No creation. What's abortion mean? No life. we got to get this. It's a death culture. Trust the Lord. He loves us. Many will not believe when you tell them that Jesus died and rose again. Verse 12. After that, he appeared in another form. Um, the word form there. Let me look. i got to... It's the word morph, you know, when something morphs, another form, uh, through the ideal of adjustment of parts or shape. He just, when you go read it, you'll see that he just did not allow them to recognize who he was. Another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country, and they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Notice this. He rose from the dead. He told him he was going to raise from the dead. See, it's not new. If you and I sit around and go, oh, I can't believe this is the end of the age. I can't believe that this is going to happen. So they didn't believe the prophets of old when they said you're going to go into captivity. They wouldn't believe any of them. They put them in prison. They locked them up. They sent them away. These people didn't believe in resurrection. It takes the Spirit of God to believe in it. It takes, it, it takes uh, hearing and, and hearing by the Word of God. Let's go look at the two. It's um, uh, what we call the, it's Luke 24. Let's go look at the two that he talked with. I tried to keep it to an hour. I'm sorry. Stuff is too good. It's Luke 24, 13. And it actually gives a, if you read Luke 24, from 1 through 12, you'll get another rendition a better testimony even that gives more light because why? Luke was a doctor and he does what's called an autopatea of the entire body of facts. An autopatea is an autopsy. And as a doctor, he was very critical in it. He does this really good autopsy of the body of Jesus or the body of Christ. Now behold, two of them were traveling on the same day to a village called Emmaus which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And as they talked of all the things which had happened, when you hang out, do you talk about what's going on in the kingdom of God? Or do you talk about football? 
So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. So now we're two or more gathered. There he is in their midst. He's meeting with them, but their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. So they know there's a person there, but they don't know that it's Jesus. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and you are sad? Then one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth. Notice it's specifically Jesus of Nazareth. Not just any Jesus. Jesus who was a prophet mighty here it is, deed and word. His deeds first, his word have a testimony and truth and veracity because of his actions before God and all the people. Notice he did what he did before God, not the people first. You always do what you do because of who God is, not because of who the people are. And how the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death. They knew what they were doing. They were pronouncing death. The death culture always knows that they want to kill truth. And crucified him. But we were hoping, our hope was in him. That it was he who was going to, what? Redeem Israel. Notice the myoptic opinion. I just got to bring that up. See, I was hoping that Donald Trump was going to save America. Oh, I get in trouble with that statement, won't I? It's not about America. It's about the world. It's about the ministry of reconciliation of souls. If you are the church, it's about souls. Donald Trump could have helped a little bit. He did help a little bit. But what I'm trying to get you to do is look out further. They are looking at just Israel. They don't even care about anybody else in the world except their own nation. Which, by the way, what this nation does will decide the whole planet. Pay attention to that. What, what the president of this nation does, that's why Donald Trump would have been a better one. Because he knew if he took care of us, he would be taking care of Israel and Jerusalem. And that he wouldn't allow death culture to do what it's doing. Although he was allowing some things to go on because there's no perfect leader. But what happened when Joe Biden comes in? Well, you talk too much about politics. Really? All of life is politics. All of life is either following the authority of God or following the authority of the devil. And the whole world lies underneath the sway of the devil. All I can tell you is truth. The only reason I would say that is because it's truth. Instantly, we signed executive orders for no life to kill babies, not only in America, but in other countries. Instantly, we signed bills to kill natural gas and oil. Instantly, we signed bills to kill bathrooms assigned for specific genders. Instantly, we signed bills to pay for sex change operations. Listen, that's called death culture. And it comes from the devil. And anybody that wants to follow the devil and continue to be one of his children, you're free to do that. God is not forcing his blood of his son on anybody, but he asks you to freely come. If you want to receive a gift of life, you can have it. But when you say, no, I don't believe, I don't want it, you're choosing to live with death culture for the rest of eternity because every one of us is eternal. And we're going to live someplace for eternity either with God or separated from God. All I want is to be able to proclaim Jesus for all the days that I have. And they're getting ready to uh, pass a bill that I won't be able to do that without going to prison. You won't read about it on the internet. It's okay. It's bigger than Israel. It's bigger than America. It's the whole world that God's concerned about. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Verse 22. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us 
when they did not find his body, they came saying that they had seen a vision. Of course, they seen uh, the angels of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Then he said to them, oh, listen to what he said to them. Oh, foolish ones. The fool has said in his heart, no to God's truth. The fool has said, I don't believe that. Oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe. See, we're in good company if we're slow to believe. But don't die not believing, or you'll be in the company of the devil. In all that the prophets have spoken. See, it's all in the Old Testament. That's why some of the false prophets of the day want to get rid of the Old Testament. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things to enter his glory? And beginning at Moses, Genesis, and first five books actually, and the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So you can read the Old Testament and find Jesus on every single page, I guarantee it. Come to Friday night, we'll talk about him on every single page. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther, but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were open, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. Notice where it was in fellowship. It was in the breaking of bread. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And any man that opens that door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. When you sit down, when you come and you're serious and watchful in prayer, when you spend time with God, your eyes will be open to see who he is. But you have to accept that invitation. To have a meal with him. Fellowship meals are very powerful in the kingdom of God. It's the first thing we're going to do when we get to heaven. Wedding supper of the Lamb. I'm trying to close this up. You guys made me go this long though. It's that woman God gave me. That's a terrible statement. Where'd that come from? Amen. Let's close this out. Uh, he said at the table, their eyes were open when they were having fellowship dinner with him. And they said to one another, there's the one another ministry, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? Notice what he was doing, opening their eyes to the truth of the scriptures. Now there is a denomination, the Mormons, who lie when they're telling you about the scriptures and they go, didn't you feel the burning in your chest? And they try to convince you with an emotional plea to receive Jesus and come into their fold and they have a lying, they move from the Bible straight to their uh, new revelation, the Mormon Bible. So don't believe the Mormons, they're, they're deceivers, they're from the synagogues of Satan. It's not about your emotions, it's about the truth of the scripture that opens your spiritual eyes. So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them and gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed. Can you say that? We're going to say that on Resurrection Sunday. See, there's an old like little thing where you say, He is risen, and they say, He is risen indeed. See, because everybody was saying He is risen, and then all of a sudden, they see him, and they know he is risen. They go, he is risen indeed. And when you know that Jesus is risen indeed, you will be a screaming evangelist from every housetop. You will tell people the truth because he set you free when you realize who he is. And he appeared to Simon, to Peter, and they told about the things that happened on the road and how he made himself known to them in the breaking of bread. Communion, co-union, breaking of bread. That's where they seen it at in the last night of his life at the, as they celebrated the Lord's Supper. And we'll stop there. So we completed uh, verse 13 of Mark 16. And we'll pick up in 14 next week. Um, I was thinking I could get it all done, but we'll wait. 
Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for setting us free. For what the Lord has set free is free indeed. Father, we ask that we would be able to see that you've rolled the stone away, the gravestone that was upon our grave, rest in peace, because we were born dead. And the wages of sin was death. And had you not died for us, we would have went straight to hell, into an eternal darkness. But we know that there is one, the devil, the deceiver, Diablos, who wants us to keep living a life of death, in a culture of death. But we ask, Lord, that you would baptize us with your spirit and give us a desire to not only walk in freedom, to not only live in freedom with our eyes fixed upon heaven, but to tell others, to be a witness and give testimony to your great love. Thank you for this amazing grace that you've given us. Bless the rest of our day. In Jesus' name. The Lord bless you. Yes.